So today we have an amazing guest, Lori Taggart. She is a licensed marriage counselor and she has been a teacher. She's been a counselor. So she's experienced all spectrums of counseling. And today we have her on the show because she wrote a book called Making Love Last. And I wanted her to share a little bit about her book because from the past, every single individual that we've had on our show, when I ask, what's the best decision you've ever made? They've all said the spouse that they've married. And so I figured it would be a great opportunity for us to talk to someone who knows a lot about making relationships last. So today we have Laura Taggart. Laura, how are you? I am great. Thank you. Good. Laura, so tell us why you wrote your book. So why I wrote the book was because I have been in you know, clinical practice for about 30 years. And most recently, I have seen so many young couples that are really struggling with keeping their marriages together. You know, when they start to have a hard time or start to have conflict, they start to think, well, maybe this isn't the right one. Maybe this is too hard. Maybe we weren't, we weren't meant to be together. And so they start thinking about exiting. And they have an idealized kind of picture sometimes that marriage shouldn't be this hard. And the reality, marriage is hard. So I wrote the book to help couples understand why marriage is hard and also to help them have skills, specific skills that will help them navigate both conflict and how to nourish the relationship, how to lean into it. I also have a, a chapter on helping them explore their own experience, their own uh, upbringing and what that uh, means in terms of uh, having expectations and difficulty managing conflict and so helping them to take an inside look so I hope it'll be a really helpful book so let me ask you this you wrote the book but what made you get into marriage counseling to begin with <laughs> okay well I got into marriage counseling because I my experience was as a child my parents had a really hard time particularly when I got into high school and all my siblings I was the youngest of four and so all my siblings had left and my mom and dad just really struggled and I realized I was in the position of trying to help them uh, at least that was my self-appointed position and I so I went from bedroom to bedroom to try and help them navigate their issues and I realized that two really good people can really miss each other in terms of communication and not understand each other. And that was my first exposure to people who really want to make it work, but are having a really hard time doing so. Wow. Okay. So that kind of teed you up for the career path that, that you had. Yeah. You know, when you talk about unmet expectations or um, unexpected conflict, disagreements, mm -hmm. I I feel like you're reading my personal marriage, but <laughs> and and here's what I think is so key, is that while no two marriages are 100% the same, we often feel like we're alone as individuals, or we're the only ones experiencing this in mm. our marriage. Yeah, and that is an absolute lie. And you, from your own knowledge, from your own experience, have seen these same situations come up again and again and again. Yes. So go into, for someone who's newly married or been married for a while, mm -hmm. about unmet expectations. Yeah. Well, a lot of times I think we come into marriage thinking that our spouse will meet our needs. And those might be conscious expectations or unconscious expectations, but we have a picture of marriage that looks a little easier than it actually is. And so when we get into the relationship and down the road, maybe maybe six months, maybe two years, we realize that this person is not going to meet all our needs. They're not going to be moving toward us like we want them to. And so we have a lot of disappointment that gets teed up by those expectations. And so we, and then we don't know what to do. We feel disappointed. We um, sometimes move into being critical to try and get the mate to be more like we expected them to be. And it begins to set up some patterns of, of conflict and uh, disillusionment that, you know, sometimes create a sense of hopelessness for a couple. How do we get out of that? Because you literally, I'm not kidding. My wife and I, we got married. We went on our honeymoon mm -hmm. and we've been married now nine years, mm -hmm. which I'm, I, 
I'm so blessed because I didn't think we'd make it that long when we first mm-hmm. started. Yeah. Literally, as soon as we got back from our honeymoon, mm-hmm. literally the honeymoon was over. <laughs> okay. And you said some stuff, you know, on the expectations or you thought they were going to be a certain way. So you were critical. You just read me. Like mm. that's, that was my response to my wife. Mm-hmm. I thought she was different than who I actually married. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know why I had this idea, expectation of who she was. I mean, we didn't live together before we got married. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have that um, pre-existing knowledge like some people do. Mm-hmm. So my, my understanding and expectation of her when I married her, I was like, oh, you're not who I thought you were. <laughs> and not that yeah. she was hiding herself from me yes. or anything like that. Maybe I was yeah. just disillusioned. I, I don't know. So yeah. So yeah. school me. Well, what happens is I think we are so unaware that we come into marriage with a certain lens. And that lens is because of our upbringing. We have certain expectations about way thing, ways things should be done, certain expectations about how our needs will be met. And a lot of times growing up, we have some wounds from childhood that we are also not so conscious of. Uh, oftentimes we tend to idealize our childhood, or if we had a really bad childhood, we tend to cut off from it and not want to talk or think about it. But the reality is, as children, we're pretty we're pretty impressionable, and our relationship with our parents and how they treated us, responded to us, if they were critical, sometimes we become critical, um, sometimes we become a pleaser and really avoid conflict. And so when our spouse, our new, our new spouse um, enters into conflict or gets mad at us, we don't know what to do. And so we slip into these patterns that we actually developed as, as kids um, to either avoid conflict or uh, engage in conflict or um, just, you know, it, it really uh, shapes our personality. And so we're so blind to that. We just right. think that's normal. And we think our way of doing things is normal and the way our family did things is normal. And of course, if our spouse, well, not if, when our spouse uh, comes from a different background, we begin to, you know, we don't understand why they're having certain responses or see through the lens that they see through. And so part of early marriage is beginning to realize we see differently and that's okay. As a matter of fact, that's to be expected. And what we can do with that is begin to, rather than focus on the other person and see their deficiencies or blame them for the conflict and problems that come up, we can begin to take an inside look and begin to notice our own reactivity, how we respond, because all of that has been conditioned based on how we grew up. And if we can become students of our own upbringing and the impact that it had on us and how we react and respond and what expectations we develop, not only will we become more self-aware, which is wonderful, but we will also be more compassionate. We'll also be compassionate with ourselves first because the wounds we have, we didn't create. The wounds we had, we were you know, we're, we're happened to us in a sense. And so we can have some self-compassion. And once we can do that, we can start to have compassion for our spouse and their wounds that cause them to react as they do. And now we're beginning on a different path, a path of understanding, a path of compassion, a path of patience. And that sets us on a, on a new direction. Do you know by chance who Dr. Shad Helmstetter is? I don't. <laughs> Sorry, my phone went off and I've always muted my phone. So Okay, no problem. I'm going to re-ask that question. I just turned my phone off. Yeah. Okay. Laura, do you know who Dr. Shad Helmstetter is? I don't. So he, he was one of the first individuals to specifically look at the brain mm. and how self-talk affects the brain. Oh, yeah. He, he's basically saying in some of his stuff the exact same thing that you said. And we've had him on one of the previous shows how mm-hmm. we are pre programmed as children. Mm-hmm. And the way we respond and react as adults often are a reflection of those programs. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't excuse our own um, reactions by any means because we're adults. We have control. We can, like you said, be students of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So for those in a marriage, how do we as individuals Mm -hmm. reprogram the way we were taught 
-hmm. so that we maybe even beforehand or as we're in marriage make it a better experience than going off of the programs that Mm -hmm. that we had in our upbringing okay so the very first thing to do in terms of reprogramming as i mentioned is self-awareness take some time to begin to notice in your next fight Notice your reactivity. Notice what happened inside you. Notice the feelings that came up. Notice uh, how, you, how you responded, what your thoughts were when it happened. And start to take, kind of put yourself under a microscope a bit and begin to explore. Because a lot of times we're just so self-justifying that we don't want to slow down and stop and look at our reactivity. Right. We want to justify it. And so this is about slowing down when it actually happens, take a few minutes afterward, usually in the middle of it, we don't have that kind of self-control to rein it in. But after the fact, shortly after, we can stop and say, hey, what was that about? Oftentimes we have a much stronger reaction than the situation warranted. And so we can begin to say, wow, what was that? Or we might even go into this self-justification. Well, what, what's that about? Why do I need to just my, justify myself so strongly? Why can't I take a look at myself? And so if you begin to become uh, interested and curious about your own reactivity to, some, to, to what your mate has done, that's the first step of becoming really self-aware. And once you become self-aware, you can begin to notice that inside, there's, it's almost as if we have parts of ourselves. You know, we have a part of ourselves that's angry or part of ourselves that's defensive or part of ourselves that avoids things. And if we can just notice that part kind of as a part of us, it doesn't define us. It doesn't mean that's who we are. We're not an angry person, but we struggle with an angry part of us. And if we can kind of almost dissociate in a way from it or, or, or detach from it a little bit and get curious and explore, what is that about? And that always, I will say 95% of the time will lead back to an experience of childhood where either, uh, let's, let's just take for an example, if you are an avoider, if you're someone who doesn't want to talk about feelings, if you're someone who feels really a lot of anxiety when your mate gets, gets upset, and um, or when your mate wants to have an emotional conversation and you just want to avoid it, chances are you've got a wound in childhood that was about parents that themselves were not comfortable with feelings. And when you had a feeling, it wasn't tended to very in a very nurturing way. And so you learn to stuff them or you learn to disconnect from your feelings. And so you not only don't understand other people's feelings, you don't even know what's going on inside of yourself. You might have a really hard time identifying a feeling, even putting a name to it, because you grew up in an avoider household where that wasn't okay to have feelings. It certainly wasn't okay to protest in any way. And it wasn't okay to even notice how you were feeling about things. You had to be more focused on the parent and the parent's response to you than pay attention to what you were feeling and identify that. So you grew up to be an avoider. And if you can begin to notice your reactivity in the present, and then what experiences, asking yourself the question, what experiences in my child might have contributed to the way that I react to my mate? Mm. Can I just let myself be open to exploring that? Maybe find a person with whom you can talk about that, a therapist, a, a friend, a pastor, someone who might be uh, you know, intuitive and wise who could help you kind of explore what, what could have happened there that might have been a wound that is deep in there and actually fuels a lot of what's happening in the present. I really like how you put being a student of yourself and even your spouse. You know, it, I met an individual a week or two ago and I was having a conversation with them and it's a conversation that I knew some stuff about Mm -hmm. and in in the conversation, I was just dead wrong and this person was so convinced that they were absolutely right Mm -hmm. and what I realized is that this individual didn't even want to take the time or even consider the possibility of them being wrong. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in marriage, Mm -hmm. that can be me at times, or that could be my wife, is that we don't even want to toy with the idea that I might be in the wrong. And I feel like self-awareness, as you talked about, is taking a step back at times and realizing, you know what, I feel justified, like you were saying, Mm -hmm. but what if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. And I realize like you have to learn to be able to question your own motives and behaviors. And I'm saying I've learned that because as you're saying this, it's donging on me like, oh, (laughs) I'm getting this. Okay. (laughs) Well, 
even Evan, that need to be right is something you likely learned in childhood. It probably wasn't okay to make a lot of mistakes. You might have gotten a, a, a severe response when you made a mistake. And so one of your learnings from childhood might be, I have to do it right. I have to be right. Because if I'm not, you know, my parent might withdraw from me. My parent might, might um, uh, criticize me. Um, I might feel unloved. And so I've got to be right in order to assure the attention and affection that I deeply long for. So these aren't cognitive processes. I mean, these aren't conscious processes on the part of a child, but they, they, they happen deep inside. Woo. I'm getting emotional over here. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was really good. Huh. Yeah. I, I literally, that makes so much sense mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. I, I never had that perspective before, but yeah. as you were saying this, I just relived some of my childhood and not that I had terrible parents because they're amazing. Yeah. yeah. But my dad had his own programming. My mom had her own programming. Absolutely. And yeah. I realized like, so my dad's the type of individual that it's not right unless if he does it himself. Mm, yeah. And yeah, he was he was severely abused growing up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't I don't fault my dad. He, and you know the way he raised us was a million times better than what mm -hmm. than what he was raised. So I'm I'm not critical of him at all. I do realize I longed for his affection. I oh, know yeah. that. Sure. But everything I did was wrong mm. because it wasn't right unless if he did it. Yeah. As you were saying that, now looking at my own marriage, mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh dear God, that daddy issue that I had of wanting his affection mm. and wanting to be right mm -hmm. is now playing out in my marriage. Yeah. Huh. And you know, Evan, what's kind of beautiful wow. about that awareness is that you can start to see it comes from a wound and start to have compassion for yourself. It's not something you chose. It's not something you want to be. It's something that was, was, was a wound because every child longs for affection and attention and approval. Every child. And when we don't get it, we are wounded. That's just the way we're designed. Right. And so when you can start to have compassion and see, that's why I do what I do today, rather than beat yourself up, you can say, oh, there's a reason for that. And I'm starting to get it now. And I can begin to release my need to be right because, and, and, and kind of have compassion for that little boy who, who really didn't receive what he needed. He didn't right. receive the unconditional love and acceptance that he longed for. And as you have compassion for him, he begins to heal and things start to change in your marriage too. Right. Well, and even, you know, being a father of two mm -hmm. and another one on the way, I'm, you know, it's making me rethink the way I, I even parent. And so, mm -hmm. man, this is a good counseling session. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, a little bit about, back, excuse me, a little bit about, ugh, I'm editing that out. Mm -hmm. So going back to, to marriage. Yeah. It, it's really unique because the first three years of my marriage felt like hell mm. or hell on earth. Mm -hmm. And it's not that my wife was a bad person because she's not, mm -hmm. she's an amazing individual. And it's not that I was a bad person. It's we both had such unrealistic expectations of each other. Yes. We both had so much hurt, so much pain, so many issues mm -hmm. that were unresolved mm -hmm. that when we brought that into our relationship, mm -hmm. it reared its ugly head. And we had to learn through counseling and through other avenues of how to, to heal. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because, you know, unexpected conflict, as you mentioned in your book, Mm -hmm. that can cause issues. It was unexpected conflict that brought my wife and I together mm -hmm. when, when we lost a child. Oh, um, yes. And it was at that moment that, you know, her and I looked at one another and it was like, either we're in this together or we're done. Mm -hmm. And just more on the terms of Christianity, the only reason, Laura, why my wife and I are married to this day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is because we believe mm -hmm. that for 
the biblical view of marriage mm -hmm. that a man and a woman is supposed to stay together. Mm -hmm. We both had that belief. Yeah. And, and I know that 50% of people's marriages end in divorce. And so if you're listening and you've had a divorce, I'm not dogging you. And I know there's pain and there's hurt. I'm talking about for my life and my wife that we had such a concrete like, nope, either we're going to be unhappy for the rest of our lives or we're just staying together. Like we had such a high reverence for marriage and the institution of marriage mm -hmm. that that's, that's what kept us together when nothing else would. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is how do people stay together when they don't have that? Because obviously 50% of relationships end in divorce. Yeah. What are some of the things necessary the, the steps, the, the tools, the wisdom that a couple needs because no one wants a divorce. No one mm -hmm. wants to hate their spouse. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think it gets back to, Evan, the fact that a lot of times we think marriage is meant to make us happy. If we're not happy, then that is, um, you know, that is evidence we should, you know, bail out or, you know, maybe it's not right, etc. The reality is marriage is tough and you're going to, you're going to have times where you hate your partner. And my husband and I, the same way, I, we would not be together today if it weren't for our, um, come hell or high water, we are staying together. And, you know, because we believe that's what God designed marriage to be, that uh, he, there's, there's power in a promise. And I talk about that in the latter chapters of the book, that it is so powerful to make this commitment to someone that says, no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter what you do, no matter what, uh, I'm in it with you here. And what that does is it creates a safety that allows you to be more intimate and more vulnerable with each other. Um, it creates a, a um, uh, you know, a commitment in terms of your long-term parenting. Uh, it just creates a solid ground for you to stand on. And I think couples who come to marriage with the idea that it's supposed to make me happy have more of a view that it's all about me mm -hmm. or all of a, a view that if, if it's about my happiness, where really, I think by God's design, marriage is so much bigger than me. It is actually something that kind of has a life of its own in one sense because um, I, I think God designed it to be a transformational experience where as we expose one another's uh, wounds and expose one another's uh, failings and expose one another's faults, we have a chance to either extend grace to our mate or condemnation to our mate. And it's that relationship for my husband and I that we each have with God and an understanding that, man, he has forgiven me and he doesn't condemn me. He loves me and he invites me to grow that that allowed us to begin to forgive faults and to begin to um, see the beauty of this transformational uh, intention of marriage. And I, I, I really believe marriage is probably God's most um, powerful tool to transform us from selfish, self-centered, it's all about me people to, wow, this, this takes work and I need to sometimes sacrifice myself in the process and learn what it means to be selfless and, and truly loving. So I, I see marriage, I think it's the, your lens, again, through which you see marriage. Is it just a, a something, an experience to make you happy? Is it a life partner that's going right. to fill your dreams? Or is marriage something that is a lifelong commitment um, for better or for worse? And when the worst happens, maybe God's in it. I tell you, one of, one of the things for me, Evan, that was so transforming was the idea that the very things that I'm having a hardest time dealing with in my mate, maybe God is using those very things about him to change me. Right. Maybe he's God's instrument in my life. And when I began to be more receptive to that possibility, things began to change. You know, I don't know who said this, but it was a joke I heard a while back. Mm -hmm. If you want to serve Jesus, mm -hmm. don't get married. If you want to <laughs> be like Jesus, get uh, married. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> my, my professor, he was telling me, um, we're talking about marriage. He was my missions professor. Mm -hmm. Good friend, his name is Jimmy, and he, you know, I was in the you know 
what do you call it? The honeymoon stage of the relationship where, mm -hmm. where we're engaged and it's all mm -hmm. uh, unicorns and rainbows. Uh -huh. And I just remember in his office one day, he goes, Evan, he goes, you have to have an unrealistic expectation of marriage in order to get married. Because if you understood what marriage was, no one would ever want to get married. <laughs> there is truth to that. <laughs> I think, you know, there's something that happens in the chemistry of our brains, you know, as researchers have shown that there's something that goes, you know, it just kind of clouds our vision when we first get married. And, and uh, once, we're, uh, once we're in it, we begin to really see the reality of okay. the partner we've married who's not nearly as perfect as we expected them to be. Well, and I think too, you know, fairy tales and romantic movies and stuff like that doesn't help this idea of what oh marriage yes is. so true because it paints such a false expectation because i you know my my wife now has come around to this point of view but when we were first married you know she'd be like why do you love me mm. <laughs> and and instead of saying all these ooey gooey feelings and emotions because we did not like each other too well um i said <laughs> I'm laughing because it's mm -hmm. a terrible response, but it mm -hmm. was so true. It's like, why do you love me? It's like, because I choose to. Mm, that's truth to that. Sometimes some seasons we do choose it. We don't feel it, but we choose it. Right. And eventually it comes around. <laughs> right. And well, now, you know, she's told me the same thing when, when we're in difficult circumstances. Like, you know, I don't like you right now, mm -hmm. but I am choosing to love you. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is something that hasn't been missing in our society. Mm, I agree. It's this I idea agree. of choosing to love. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I know so many people that look at marriage as a source of happiness. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my issue growing up. I'm probably a little bit different than most guys in the context that like my ultimate dream in life mm -hmm. outside of wanting to be eventually someday a pastor was to – get married and have a family. Mm -hmm. And I think I had this false understanding that, okay, once I get those things, I will know what real love is. Mm. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. I do know what real love is now far more than I ever expected, but I think I was looking at, to, at it to satisfy a hole in my own life, in my mm -hmm. own heart, mm -hmm. whether that's through hurts or pains that I've had through, through my own family or school or just through the fallen sin of man where we have that that hole in our heart that only only Christ himself can feel. Yeah. But what I realized is marriage is not, it's not about making myself happy. No, it's and not. Mm. So that being said, happiness, several things can, can ruin a happy marriage. Um, money mm -hmm. and sex. Mm-hmm. I would really like to talk about both of those because, mm -hmm. you know, oh, man, my, I hope my wife doesn't kill me talking about some of this stuff. <laughs> you know, we are in a spot finally after nine years of marriage that we're like, okay, we have more money coming in than, than going out each month. Mm -hmm. Finally. Mm -hmm. And money was a big deal. And how, what advice do you have for couples that live paycheck to paycheck, that struggle financially, mm -hmm. is this idea of, of budgeting. Um, you know, my wife's way of coping with it is I just don't want to look at it mm -hmm. because if I don't look at it, it doesn't exist. And if I confront it, I feel anxious. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm like, let's take the bull by the horns. Let's make the sucker ours and control it. Mm -hmm. And so we both had two different perspectives. However, I'm the spender Mm -hmm. And she was the, you know, I see you spending money and I don't get to do my hair. I don't mm -hmm. get some of these basic things, which I was in the wrong for because, you know, she deserved those things. So what advice do you give mm -hmm. people that struggle with money? Yeah. Well, money is usually always a symptom of something deeper. It's usually a symptom of uh, anxiety, as you said, as a control um, our self-centered expectations. And so money just kind of has a way of surfacing uh, issues that I think are at the core of why money is such a problem. And um, so, 
you just described when you described yourself and your wife, Evan, so many couples that I sit with, I'd say probably the majority, there is one person in it that wants to do the budgeting, has more of the beaver mentality. They want to, they want to get to it, nail it down, feel like it's a controllable thing. And the other person has, has, you know, either sometimes come from a background where, um, you know, money was a big issue. Maybe they came out of some very financial hardship growing up and they just don't want pressure around money. They don't want to, as you described your wife, they don't want to really think about it. They just want it to, to be there, but they really don't want to, you know, go through the discipline of having a budget of any kind. So most couples differ on this and their interest in doing budgeting and their interest in, you know, kind of spending uh, so, so, so many couples have differences in this regard. And I think the first step really for couples is to begin to appreciate the other person's history and to talk together about what was it like in your own family growing up with money? What were, what were some of the beliefs you began to develop early on about money? The value of money, the importance of money, the, um, the use of money. Uh, and so get to know each other in terms of your context uh, growing up for how you perceive money and then as you begin to try to move forward with practically with your own life um, be sensitive to those realities of their upbringing when you start to talk about hey honey I don't want to constrain you with the budget I don't want to bring up bad news so how can we make this process as um, doable for you as possible and yet calm some of my anxiety about not knowing where it's going so right. let's work with this together. I don't want to bombard you with a budget and have you do it exactly my way. But I also, you know, she may be feeling anxious even addressing it and you might feel anxious not addressing it. And so there has to be some resolution. And so I think as you both soften, if you understand each other's histories related to money, you can come together and soften the discussion and say, hey, I, I want to, I understand now where you were coming from. I don't want to strong arm this thing. And, or you come to it and say, you know, I realize I avoid money because my history, it's, it's a painful thing, you know, as I think about my own history. Um, but I, I realize as a couple, we have to have a plan because we've got two, almost three kids and we've got to, you know, we've got to have a plan for what we do with this. So let's come together. Let's try and make this as, as you know, good for each of us as possible. And if I step on your toes, you let me know if, if you, you know, if you find your avoider kind of part, that part of you that's an avoider taking over, let's talk about that. <laughs> See if we can get that part to kind of step back and allow us just to have a, a gentle plan, you know, something that will offer guidelines and, and uh, guardrails and allow us to move forward. Right. Well, a couple of the things that has helped my wife and I in that area, because here's the thing, while I'm the go-getter, take the bull by the horns, I'm also the worst at math. I'm like, my wife works for a bank. She's really, really good at actually budgeting and doing those things, yeah, uh -huh. but as the avoider, I'm not good at those things and I like tackling it. And so there, there's this in our marriage, this yin and yang where, where we will work better together than separate. Cause mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember when I tried to do, do some of it, I, oh man, I, I messed up our budget so bad. <laughs> and she realized she had to be a part of it. And anyway, yeah, yeah. what I've realized there's some advice out there that says, well, make budgeting or make this like a date night. Have fun with it. That's terrible advice. <laughs> Don't ever make something that's stressful a date night. Yeah, yeah. That's terrible, terrible, terrible advice. <laughs> Trust me, I've learned from experience. <laughs> uh -huh. But the other thing too is set it on a calendar. Mm -hmm. you know, things that you guys don't want to do or don't enjoy, but you have to bring up, mm -hmm. I recommend calendaring it Yeah, because, you know, within my company, there's this quote within Keller Williams, if it's not on your calendar, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, we know, you know, the, the third of every month, the 17th of every month, we're getting mm -hmm. together, we're planning on paying our bills and making sure we're, we're we're good. Yeah. You know, so there's this focus. Let me ask you, leading from money, one of the other major causes of divorce is lack of intimacy, sexual intimacy. Yeah. And I'm probably not going to talk about my own family on this because I know my wife would kill me. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> I, I just don't want to leave it up to imagine or not imagine. So I'm just going to let you mm -hmm. be more of just the speaker on this subject. Okay. 
Yeah, intimacy, all couples kind of, again, they have their own history around intimacy. And a lot of times with young couples, um, I find there's been some, um, some kind of uh, tampering with our sexual, our mental sexual images, you know, with pornography. Pornography is often a problem, whether it's a Christian community or not. It, 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 it seems to find its way into every community. And that has colored sometimes uh, an attitude that some, some husbands have around sexuality. And then a lot of times women, girls, young women have wounding that's occurred sexually. They've been either, um, uh, uh, drawn to do things they didn't want to do or they have some guilt related to their sexual selves and so it's fraught with tension often at the very beginning and um, even if you didn't live together or have sex before marriage there's just a lot of uh, expectations around the sexual relationship and so um, what I what I encourage couples to do is to and it really depends I mean there the problems are you know it can be from attitudinal things, it can be an actual sexual dysfunction, it can be a pornography use. Um, I've had young couples, I've had I mean, one young man, one young husband, you know, who just would not give up pornography, for instance. And his wife was very, very wounded and um, he kept saying, well, it doesn't affect anyone, it only affects me. Well, the truth is pornography does affect right. not only you and your biochemistry and in terms of your, your, uh, your um, brain function uh, it's a very addictive thing and uh, you know i won't go into the details of all of that but it just biochemically it affects your brain and creates a, a wanting more and also it, it affects the way in which you see your spouse and what they not only you know need to do for you but you're looking at images that are very idealized as well and so it makes it hard for her to feel warmly loved and accepted and attractive to you so that's that's been a big issue for young couples and so I just want to put that out there it's not uncommon um, there's a lot of great help for that there's um, you know certified sex addiction therapists at our counseling center we have a whole unit on sexual addiction um, so there's good sex addiction help um, pureintimacy.org is another wonderful resource but it's really important if you have that issue to get in community don't try and do it by yourself um, it's one of those things it's hard to extricate yourself from if you're trying to go it alone in terms of recovery um, but in addition to that um, you know our oftentimes I think we as women have and, and men, men and women have been sold a bill of goods regarding sex. And that is that it's really more about the guy. It's more about his pleasure, his satisfaction than it is about the woman. And so the woman develops a mentality that she, you know, she, it's not about her, you know, it's about satisfying him. So then she uses it in the relationship when she's unhappy as some sort of leverage or um, the guy thinks, well, it is all about me. And so he develops a more predatory attitude toward his wife, which is very off-putting for her. She doesn't feel right. like being vulnerable. She doesn't feel like it's safe. And so that idea that sex is for the guy has been, I think, one of the biggest lies that we have uh, you know, digested from the culture and from media. Because the reality is God designed sex to be really enjoyable for both of us and to be the most intimate connection we have if you just look at the physiology of sex and the fact that when we this is kind of an interesting thing is that we have we have something in our body a hormone called oxytocin mm -hmm. and when we as women have babies that oxytocin surges in our bodies and creates this warm, loving attachment to our infant. And a lot of times, young moms, first moms will say, wow, where did that come from? I feel so bonded to my child, and it's this oxytocin. Well, men, women have 10 times more than men on any given day, but there's one time that men have that experience of that high degree of loyal bonding, and it happens to be after sex. His oxytocin surges and begins to match that of a woman, which is kind of a beautiful design of a kind of men having a kind of a hormonal uh, motivation to stay emotionally connected to their wife. They, they feel bonded to her after sex. And I think a lot of times women don't understand that. And sometimes they get frustrated because he wants sex more than she does. That's common. Not always true. Okay. Sometimes the wife wants it more than he does. And I think that causes a lot of conflict for couples too is frequency. How often are we going to be having sex? And um, so 
Uh, I have a couple questions for yeah, you. Yeah, sure. For starters, I want to make a point because just to go back to the pornography issue, when you said men with the oxytocin, oxytocin feel most intimate after having sex, I think that's one reason why men don't understand how hurtful pornography is Yeah, because it's the very thing that will draw you away from mm -hmm. your spouse when you have those emotions um, attached elsewhere. So I wanted to say that. Yeah. But two, I how, how do you deal with the man or the woman that the woman thinks sex is m the majority for just for the man Yeah. or the man thinks that it's the majority for him? Because mm -hmm. um, there's that. And then also, um, yeah, go, go, go there. And then I'll, I have another question that I yeah. have for you. Well, for women, I just help them begin to focus in on their own bodies and the way their bodies are made and how God really intended us to be in, enjoy this experience. You know, the only reason we have a clitoris is there's one function to it. There's no other function, and that is for pleasure. And that kind of is a strong indication of what right. God desires for we as women. He so much wants us to experience a joy and um, connection and exhilaration in our sexual experience and so it's not all about the guy I, and I so I try and when I speak to women speak to moms groups and things I say it you know it's not all about the guy that's pretty strong evidence that it's not all about the guy we have been sold a bill of goods since we were very very young things that are said things you know and and sometimes you know experiences of being um, uh, taken advantage of by guys and so a lot of women have some negative associations they make with sex and if, if you've been sexually abused which is about one in four women you have often a very negative uh, 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 memory of sex and so it can tamper the relationship that you have with your husband sexually so being able to process through that is really important so that you can begin to feel a little bit more free to experience all that that was intended to be so for women I just encourage them to spend a little time focused on their bodies and what brings them pleasure begin to notice what begins to bring them pleasure um, uh, there's many you know the woman's body has many areas of sexual sensitivity and so and it changes every night this is the frustrating thing for a guy it's not the same every night it's going to change it roams and so you need to be a really attentive lover and attentive student of your wife because she, and encourage her to tell you that's another thing I encourage women to do is your husband's not going to know what feels good to you and you right. need to start paying attention to what feels good to you and begin to share that openly with him so that he can be be a more attentive uh, in his lovemaking. Have you ever seen the episode of Friends where it was Chandler and, Cho uh, Chandler and Joey were talking to Monica and uh -huh. they thought there was only one pleasure place for a woman and then like Rachel and Monica were like, no, there's like six or seven and, uh -huh. and they drew it out on a sheet of paper and she was talking about it but <laughs> it never informed the audience what those pleasure points were. Oh, I it was yeah. Just I didn't see that, but I would love that. I might use that sometime when Good. I do my teaching. Yeah. Well, I'll um, watch the episode first, but it, yeah, it, I will. I will. That is funny. Yeah. So we, we're, we're, we've been created in quite an amazing way. And, you know, there's several books that are really helpful. Um, a Sheila Gregor's book on um, A Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. That's a really wonderful book to kind of begin to loosen up and explore this area for yourself and, and heal also. Um, but for the guys, you asked about the guys as well. I encourage them to begin to notice their first exposure to sex and what messaging they started to get around sex and to begin to, again, entertain the possibility that maybe that's, that's not what it is at all. And this is intended to be a place of sexual connection, and it's going to take some tenderness, it's going to take some patience, and it's going to take some attunement to what brings your wife pleasure. It's not all about scoring. It's really about learning to be a patient and tender lover that is going to be most satisfying for her. And usually what's most satisfying for her ends up being the most satisfying experiences for him as well. Talk about frequency, mm -hmm. because I feel like – you know, as a younger couple, we had, my wife and I had more belly button to belly button time mm -hmm. than we do now with children. Yeah. And children have made it harder. And, you know, my wife and I, how can I put this? Because of that, there, there is a, a lack of, of consistency. Yeah. And for us, we don't get mad or angry at one another. It's, you know, 
when it does happen, it's like, okay, let me satisfy your needs. You know, that mm-hmm. I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that just happens. Yeah. So we tried this for a little bit where, where we would actually schedule it. Like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, if it's not on the calendar, it doesn't exist. So there's this dilemma, like, if we don't schedule it, it's not spontaneous. It's not romantic. It's not these things. It's, it's not real. Mm-hmm. But then if, you know, and that's by scheduling it, but if we don't schedule it, it just also har- rarely happens. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not throwing my specific situation under the bus. I'm not, <laughs> by any means. I'm just saying, since we now have children, I've noticed mm-hmm. that there's been a decline in that and not that I'm mad or angry. It's just, the Mm -hmm. natural of being a parent right now. And I'm okay with that. But how do we get back to that spot? Because, you know, if you stay in that spot too long, it can Mm -hmm. start developing a wedge and we're not there yet, but I don't want to get there either. Yeah. Well, I really am a big fan of of scheduling in in that situation. And you've just spoken, Evan, for most young couples who have kids, this is the reality. It is not as frequent. There's, and a lot of times um, I think, you know, there's, there's, I, I had an attitude, and I think a lot of young moms had an attitude when I was a young mom that said, hey, kids are my first priority. You can wait. You know, this, all my energy is getting absorbed. I have nothing left. You can wait. And that you can wait can only last so long. And I, I feel like being able to have a schedule, even though it does not sound romantic and spontaneous is a good solution not necessarily the rest of your married life but for a season of your life where it's really hard to uh, make time for the sexual relationship I'm a big fan of being able to you know set a time uh, and let that be you know one of the things you can do is you can you can have the attitude well it's not spontaneous so it doesn't count or you can have the attitude like, this is something I'm going to look forward to. I know this is going to happen. We're going to make it special. It's going right. to be like, like a date that I look forward to. And I'm going to you know, look forward to it with anticipation. Maybe I'm going to send, send her a little text. Or maybe I'm going to send him a little note. And we're going to you know, look forward to it and make it, make it special. Right. Well, um, it's the yeah. same way with dates. It, rarely dates mm-hmm. are spontaneous you know, bef- like before you're in a relationship. You schedule those because it's yeah. important. So I, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And there are other, you know, and, and being able to have a little, you know, sometimes young couples don't have family around or uh, don't have the opportunity to take a little getaways. I'm really encouraged that if it's possible, you know, at least every six months or so have a little one, one overnight or somewhere that can be just nourish your relationship. If it can be more frequent, great, but do that in addition to making sure that you have fairly regular sexual connection. Okay. Yeah. I, but I am a fan of scheduling. I think it's a good idea. And um, I think a lot of couples have benefited from it. And that's not the only sexual encounter you, need, you, you have. You can always have the spontaneous times too, but at least do something that you can look forward to and feel like it's a regular connecting oxytocin releasing <laughs> opportunity. Right. So, there, this subject is so vast, but what have what question have I not asked that's something that you want to touch on? Mm. Oh, let's see. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, There's a lot of things as a couple you can do to nourish your relationship. You know, there's a lot of ways you can begin to just on one of the things, let let me back up a little bit. One of the things that uh, is so true is that it's not the, it's not the big vacations that cement a relationship and uh, it, it's the small increments of daily behavior that really help a couple feel close. And so there's little behaviors you can do every day that are going to f- make you feel really connected, make you feel more available to sexual connection too, mm-hmm. because you're feeling more emotionally connected. And those are simple things. One of the things I mentioned in my book in the chapter Lean In is just to have when you leave in the morning, Make sure that you kiss each other goodbye and share with each other one thing that's on your mind that day, one conversation you anticipate having, one 
difficult thing you're going to have to do, one errand you're going to have to run. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be a big thing. It's just a little thing just to give your mate a little sense of your day so that they can be thinking about you, perhaps praying for you. And then at the end of the day, when you come back together, make sure you kiss each other hello. You know, a lot of times I find couples are busy on their computer and they don't even greet their mate when they come to the door. And so get up from your computer step away go to the you know go greet your mate when they come home you know sometimes the dog gets more excited than the, than the spouse does that you get home so make sure you get a little excited when they get home it's important to you that they've come home whoever is home first act and like a dog act like a dog yeah act like a dog and then um sometime over the course of dinner or whatever ask each other what happened with that one thing that that was going on during the day just show an interest in the life of the other person and yeah. then be sure you have some form of affection before you go to bed. Hug, kiss. Um, it doesn't have to be sex, you know, all that is, but right. it, but just some form of affection. And I really encourage couples, and a lot of young couples, this, this doesn't happen, but go to bed together. Try to go to bed at the same time. And also get your technology out of the bedroom. Those phone calls and those texts are not so urgent that you have to respond to them right away. They interfere with the conversation and the connection you have at bedtime. So put them somewhere else. Life goes on without technology. Put them out of the bedroom. So that is your sacred space. Don't let others into your sacred space. You know, I had, I took a, a marriage and family course in college when I was at ORU. And one of the things the, the professor said is him and his wife never had a TV in their bedroom. And you know, in my young, zealous youthfulness, you know, mm -hmm. pre-marriage engagement. And I was like, we're never going to have a TV in our bedroom. And I can mm -hmm. honestly say to this day, we still have not had a TV in our mm -hmm. bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for that because you're mm -hmm. right. Technology is such a thief. And specifically about TV and spending time with one another, there was a good while that, you know, we would come home separately I would still be on and off my phone. I'm a real estate agent. I get calls all the time. Mm. My wife's crowding the kids. They go to bed. And then we're just like exhausted. And so we sit down and we watch a movie mm -hmm. or we watch TV. But then I noticed our relationship was getting frustrated. Mm. It was getting, because we weren't spending that time. You know, we, we felt like we were spending time together because we we're watching TV together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my wife was a little bit more vocal about it than I was saying, hey, this is not spending time. I want you mm -hmm. want your attention. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, I have no problem with that. We'll, we'll start spending a little bit more time. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things that we do, not all the time, but I would say at least 50% of the time, because it switches between, I don't want to talk to you. I just want to watch and zone out right mm -hmm. now too, mm -hmm. or we'll spend 15, 20 minutes on the couch, just talking mm -hmm. or, Typically, she goes to bed first, and mm -hmm. I need to take your advice seriously about going to bed at the same time because that's smart. That's mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah, I think any time you can, you know, protect the time you have together, one of the other things I recommend couples do is just have a, a 15 to 20 minute protected conversation every night, kind of what we, like what you just described. Yeah. Just take 15, 20 minutes, um, check in on the day. Um, even find out if you have an, if one of you is an avoider, sometimes a part of that conversation can be what feelings came up for you today. You know, let's talk about those and, and leave some time for them to figure that out. And, you know, sometimes that, that conversation about the, you know, emotions, about the relationship, about, so it's not all about, you know, logistics. It's really more of a, a, a personal conversation that you have. Right. So I have about three ending questions that I ask every guest mm -hmm. and I want to change them up a little bit mm -hmm. instead of making them specific about, you know, the guest, um, I want to make them about marriage. Mm -hmm. So okay. the first question is in your experience, what do you see the biggest lies in self-talk that people have about marriage or their spouse? Mm. Well, I think the biggest lie is probably my spouse is to blame mm -hmm. <laughs> because that keeps the focus on the spouse that keeps you in a place of dissatisfaction and disillusionment. It uh, continues to create conflict uh, because there's just not, you know, if you're focused on my spouse is to blame. It also um, makes you a victim. It makes you a victim. 
it justifies any self, any justification, it justifies any rationalizations you're doing about your own behavior. It prevents you from having an opportunity to take that inside look. And I love what Proverbs 25 says, the heart of a person is like deep waters, but one who has understanding draws it out. And so we're encouraged to look inside. It's not, it's not um, self-preoccupation to be self-aware. Right. And so learning to do that helps you to stop the blaming. But when we get into the blame game, oh, it is so uh, tempting and so rewarding because we feel so superior, but it's just not helpful. Right. You know, side note, um, there was a recent thing with a really well-known minister, Kenneth Copeland, that some sort of company tried to catch him off guard, target him. And they tried to take a quote of him, you know, talking about flesh and blood. We do not have war against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, darkness of this mm -hmm. age. And trying to misquote him on that by calling people demons. Mm -hmm. Within the Christian perspective, mm -hmm. the idea of not wrestling against flesh and blood, meaning we do not, we're not at war or at mm -hmm. aught with you or me or my spouse and myself or a neighboring country, mm -hmm. but really that there's this spiritual environment that's going on and spiritually there's, there's warfare that there's attacking. Yeah. And in the context of marriage, one of the things that I've learned, you know, going back to what you're saying is that my spouse isn't to blame. You know, a lot of those feelings of a victimhood or she's at fault come from the place that aren't my own true thoughts or feelings about my wife aren't my own identity or the way I want to look at. And then I have to ask myself, well, then why am I looking at her that way? Mm -hmm. And just for our listeners out there, you know, God created Adam and then he later created Eve. God originally created Adam in his image, meaning God's image. When Adam, when God saw that Adam was alone in the Bible, it talks about God pulled something outside of Adam. You know, people say a rib um, it could have been the feminine qualities of God in man originally. And then he created Eve and then he made the two together. If God made Adam in his image, and then when he separated woman from man, then Adam was no longer 100% created in the image of God. But it wasn't until Adam and Eve in marriage represented the unity of God. So I say all that to say, if God is real, and he created marriage to be in his image, then that means that there's also a, an enemy and that that enemy would want to destroy the image of God. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that do or don't believe, you have to realize that your marriage, my marriage, will be under attack. Mm -hmm. And that fighting for your marriage isn't just fighting to love one another or fighting against one another, but that there are little spiritual forces that want your marriage to end. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that understanding, I would highly suggest doing that because then your intensity and your care and your proactiveness to protecting your marriage will go through the roof. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I just, I had to add that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think brings most marriages peace? I think what brings, I, I can speak to that personally, what brought our marriage peace after some uh, seasons of, of uh, a high degree of conflict and dissatisfaction was the awareness that God is in it and he is using even the hard times, especially using the hard times and the things we don't like about the other person to do some shaping of us. Um, I remember a very specific time where I just felt like I was so dissatisfied. I was so hurt. I was so disappointed in God for what was happening. I, I, I thought I deserved better. Yeah, you probably heard that before. But I realized it was like it was, wasn't an audible voice, but it was like this sense in my spirit that, Laura, get out of my way. I have got Gary. Mm. And it was like, I can release him. I can, I can let go of my expectations. I can know that he is good. And that he has my best interest at heart. And he's working harder on Gary than I am. So I can relax and right. just enjoy him. And also what brings me peace is to 
that gives me freedom knowing he loves me and he's in charge. It gives me freedom to look at myself more honestly and acknowledge and admit my faults. When I can look at the ways I protect myself honestly and acknowledge them and have some compassion for myself, but then have compassion for my mate as well, that, that changes the whole direction of our relationship. Right. What's the best decision you've ever made? Well, like many of your viewers, Evan, <laughs> it certainly would be my husband, marrying, marrying my husband at the ripe young age of 20 and 21. <laughs> wow. Laura, how can I add value to you? Well, Evan, I think you already have actually, just by having this conversation and uh, helping viewers kind of hang in there with their marriages. You know, that was my whole intention in writing my book is to help, help uh, salvage and nourish and redeem marriages. And so I hope that'll have that effect, just like I hope what you've done today will have that effect too. Awesome. Where do you want people to buy your book? Amazon, your website, a local bookstore? Yeah, I do have a website. I do, I do have a blog on my website. That's www.laurataggart.com. Um, I've also got other speaking things there, but I, I don't sell my book on my website. So you can go to Amazon to get it or your local bookstore. Buy local if you can. Keep the money in your community. <laughs> well, Laura, thank you so much for your time and your life experience. This conversation was very illuminating for areas of my own life. And, you know, it reassured me that I'm doing some things right and some things that I needed to personally change. Mm. So I really appreciate you. Thank oh. you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Evan. My, my delight. Have a great day. Thank you.